Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce to you former Secretary of Defense William Perry, an investigative journalist, writer, and producer of the films Command and Control and The Bomb, Eric Schlosser. Well, thank you all for coming out for this lighthearted evening. Uh, I'll just say very briefly that I started research for a book about a nuclear weapons accident in 2007, and I thought it would take about a year, a year and a half to do the book, and I wound up taking six years because I found so many accidents and near misses and problems in the control of our nuclear arsenal. That's a clip from a film which is an experimental film that will be at the Berlin Film Festival in a few weeks. And when people ask me to describe it, I say it's a, it's a mix between Kiana Squatsi and Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and so it will be done in Berlin with a, with a live score by a wonderful band, The Acid. And in the six years that I was researching command and control, I was able to meet with some of our leading nuclear weapons designers uh, bomber pilots who had flown missions with nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon repairmen, high-level Pentagon officials, and I can say quite honestly, firstly, they did not fit the liberal stereotype of mad bombers wanting to destroy the world. I met incredible heroes who risked their lives to prevent nuclear catastrophes. But of all the personal heroes that I met and I've gotten to know, uh, the man sitting to my right is near the top of the list. He is a true public servant who has been involved in nuclear weapons issues for more than half a century and has devoted most of his career to trying to prevent any nuclear <coughs> catastrophe. And Bill Perry is renowned in this world for being calm, level-headed, reasonable, and um, if he's worried about the subject, we really should be. Too. So I guess I want to start out, Bill, by asking you, you know, your career spans the Cold War, certainly since the late 1950s, early 1960s, to the end of the Cold War, to today, and how worried are you right now as we sit here about the risk of a nuclear catastrophe or the risk of a nuclear war? You know, I believe that the danger today of a nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War. Greater. And there are many things could be done to dramatically reduce that danger, but we're not doing them. And we're not doing them because we don't understand the danger and we don't understand the importance of taking those actions. That's why I've devoted my career now, the last five or ten years of it, to educating. And to this, I'm doing it in pedestrian ways, writing books, giving classes, putting uh, classes on the internet, what's called MOOCs, trying to get the word across, especially to younger people. I'm especially pleased to be in an audience like this. I'm an amateur at how you, how you get these ideas across, and I'm talking now to a group of professionals, hoping to engage some of you to be concerned about this problem, so you can help in this task of getting the word out. What can we do about it? How dangerous it is and what can be done to reduce the dangers? And, uh, I mean, your, your first-hand involvement with nuclear weapons began during the Cuban Missile Crisis and then extended through your tour uh, at the Pentagon. And I'm wondering, can you mention a couple of incidents that at the time were not really well known to the public, the actual details, but that really scared the hell out of you? Well, at the time, I was not one of the decision makers. I was a young, young pup in those days, but I was asked to come in and help work on a small intelligence team that would spend every day looking at the information collected during that day and write a report. By midnight, we'd have that report finished and it'll be on the desk of President Kennedy the next morning. And this was during the Cuban crisis? This is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I did, about, I did that for about 10 or 11 days. And every day when I went into the analysis center, based on what I knew, I believed it was going to be my last day on Earth. That was my, that was my view of, of the danger of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, President Kennedy has said, retrospectively, that he thought there was one chance in three 
that the Cuban Missile Crisis would erupt into a nuclear catastrophe. One chance in three. I, my view is that Kennedy was an optimist. <coughs> it was really more dangerous than that because there were things going on that we didn't know and therefore we weren't telling the president. For example, we didn't. We knew that the big missiles that they had in Cuba did not yet have the nuclear warheads. And President Kennedy was making his decisions based on that judgment. What we didn't know, and therefore he didn't know, was that the Soviets had already deployed smaller missiles in Cuba that did have nuclear warheads and with commanders that had the authority to use them. And so if Kennedy had accepted the unanimous recommendation of his military, namely to invade Cuba, our troops would have met with a tactical nuclear blast. They would have been obliterated on the beaches. And more than that, they would probably have then escalated into a general nuclear war. So the dangers were even greater than we knew at the time. And at the time, I thought it was all over. One of the things that really concerned me when I read the history uh, doing my research for my book was that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had the leader of the United States and the leader of the Soviet Union absolutely determined to do whatever they could to avoid a nuclear war. Neither one wanted a nuclear war, and yet we almost got one anyway. And what it spoke to, to me was the difficulty of controlling these weapons. I mean, the president may not want a war, but what if some low-level officer has the authorization to use a weapon, feels like he's under attack? And wasn't there an incident where a Russian submarine commander thought that his submarine was under attack and was authorized to use and nuclear weapons in that situation. And just as with the tactical nuclear weapon on the ground that we talked about, the Soviets had also put tactical nuclear weapons on torpedoes in their submarines. And one of the submarines that was escorting the ships that were going into Cuba, one of the submarines came under an attack by an American destroyer dropping depth charges on it, hoping to make the submarine surface. And the captain was ready to fire his torpedo at our destroyer with a nuclear warhead on it. It would, of course, not only destroy the torpedo, the, war, the, the destroyer, but very likely, again, would have escalated into a general nuclear war. Again, we didn't know that at the time either. We only found that out years later. So in general, though, Eric, I would say, all during the Cold War, we obsessed that we were going to get a surprise attack from the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union obsessed the opposite of that. And all of our policy, all of our planning, all the weapons we built were designed to meet that contingency. In retrospect, that was never a danger. That, because neither of our presidents really wanted to start a war. What was the danger was we blunder. We blunder in the nuclear war. Cuban Missile Crisis was the primary example of that, but not the only example. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the problem ultimately is that human beings are involved. <laughs> and, well, that's uh, a problem. It's always a problem. No matter, no matter how impressive the technology, it's going to be flawed because it was created by people and it's going to be managed by people. I mean, in the case of the Soviet submarine, there was one officer that had to be a unanimous vote of three officers on the submarine to use a nuclear weapon, and two of them voted to use the nuke. Two voted yes against. and one no. <laughs> yeah. Look. Now, on this issue of technology, um, I seem to remember you got a late night phone call once uh, about the United States being under attack. Well, we can blunder into nuclear war two different ways. Through a miscalculation, as that almost happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, based on bad information. Or we could launch an attack based on a false alarm. Uh, our missiles then, and I might say now, on, on uh, high alert, ready to launch in a few minutes' notice on what we call launch on warning policy. So if our missile detection system at the North American Air Defense Command determines that a missile was be being fired at the United States, they get that message to the president. The president then has about five or six minutes to decide whether he's going to launch an attack before those missiles strike our ICBM sites. Our ICBMs are all at fixed locations and therefore it's presumed that any attack on the United States, that they would be the first of the targets. And so the president has to decide, are we going to let the missiles land uh, and destroy our ICBMs? And if we don't let them land and decide to launch before that, what if we're wrong? Well, we have been wrong three times that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. False one. One of them, uh, I, I was personally uh, 
called at 3 o'clock in the morning by the watch officer telling me that his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. And for one heart-stopping moment, I believed we were about to ex experience the catastrophe that we had somehow avoided during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, he quickly went on to explain he thought this was a false alarm. And he wanted to discuss with me why his computers were giving him false signals. Uh, it took us a couple of days, actually, to figure out why it was giving him false signals, because a very simple thing. Some operator, as they changed watches, the new operator in the computer put the tape on the computer, the, what he thought was the operating tape. It turned out to be a training tape, simulating, simulating an attack on the United States. It looks very realistic. Uh, happily, the general that night uh, was sober, careful, <laughs> experienced, and he thought to Stu and said, this doesn't look right. And he decided it was a false alarm. Had he called the president at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you have six minutes to decide whether to launch our missiles or not, who knows what the president would have done? Who knows today what the president would have done if he gets a call and has six minutes to decide? No context, no context, no basis for making a judgment. So that was a problem during the Cold War. It was, I would say, the miscalculation, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the accident, uh, misinterpreting a false alarm, were the real dangers we had during the, Cuba, during the Cold War, not the dangers of a deliberate attack on the United States. And those dangers still exist today. We still have a launch on warning policy. We still have the possible of our two presidents blundering into war if we have another crisis comparable with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, uh, you know, Eric uh, did his presentation on the Stuxnet virus, but one of the real threats to our nuclear command and control system today is the possibility of someone, probably a government, hacking into that system and uh, creating a false alarm or spoofing the United States into um, launching a missile. So if you, were to, if you were to rank, just for those who really want to be worried later tonight, um, <laughs> what are the nuclear, the primary nuclear threats that concern you right now as we, as we sit here? What are the categories that you think, are, think are the, the most number important? one danger of a nuclear catastrophe not a war, but a nuclear catastrophe would be a terror group getting a nuclear bomb and setting it off in one of our cities. And you know I've made a short video dramatizing what would happen if a nuclear bomb went off in Washington, D.C. And it's not just, it's not just 80,000, 100,000 people killed. It's the economic and the political and the social consequences are beyond imagination. You all know how we reacted after 9-11. Now imagine an event which is a hundred times more catastrophic. How would we react? Would it be sober and careful and considered? We would react in panic. And aside from losing our civil liberties, we would do stupid things. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing we were. So that would be number, that would be number one among us. The most likely, not the most catastrophic, but the most likely. Um, and I and just, and that's crowd this evening, um, the RAND Corporation, which is based in Santa Monica, uh, has done high-level nuclear studies, many of them top secret, dating back to the early 1950s. And a decade ago, they did a study of what would happen to the port of Long Beach if a terrorist improvised nuclear device was detonated there. And this is a relatively small nuclear device, about half the size of the one that was in that film, which was set off in Alamogordo in 1945. So, this is half the power of the first Trinity test of a nuclear weapon 71 uh, years ago. Uh, if it went off in the port of Long Beach, there would be 60,000 people dead instantly from the blast and from the serious high levels of radiation. There would be 150,000 people exposed to potentially lethal levels of radiation. An estimated six million people would try to leave Los Angeles County and uh, would probably be unable to because of uh, traffic. Uh, That's nothing new. <laughs> uh, gasoline supplies would quickly run out in Los Angeles because the refineries are located in Long Beach. And in one of the really most disturbing statistics, there'd be about 50,000 people with serious burns and the problem is right now in California, there are 200 beds 
in California burn centers. And uh, there are 2,000 beds in burn centers across the United States. And the damage from one terrorist nuclear weapon in Long Beach would be greater than one trillion dollars. And in telling you this, and I'm now into my 10th year for me of, of looking at these nuclear weapons issues, I don't feel apocalyptic. I don't have a desire to depress other people. <laughs> these things are preventable. And what's necessary for them to be prevented is public awareness, public concern. Uh, the most successful television movie ever made was called The Day After. It was about the aftermath of a nuclear uh, strike on the United States. It was seen by the high, it got the highest ratings of any fictional television show. And it was also watched at the White House by President Ronald Reagan. And it played a real role in persuading Reagan uh, out of being an advocate of nuclear weapons into being sincerely committed to abolishing nuclear weapons. So you can't minimize the possible impact of our culture and a popular culture on these very, very important issues. Um, yeah, let's let, uh, ask Dr. Perry to set up his video. Tell us why this video was made, what was the purpose, and then we'll show it. We put together, this is, I, with some hesitation, sure, this movie is a professional movie maker. This is an amateur effort. It was intended to show, to dramatize what would happen if a nuclear bomb did go off, for example, in Washington, D.C. It takes a worst case scenario, but a realistic scenario. And let's show it to you so you come to your own conclusions about it. This is the potential consequence of one, one, one nuclear bomb. And we're now making a YouTube video like this, dealing with a nuclear war starting as a result of a false alarm, an accidental nuclear war which of course would be far more catastrophic, but this would be essentially be the end of civilization. Uh, incidentally, uh, you saw that was a completely amateur protect. That was my voice in the narration, and for this new one, we're looking for a real professional <laughs> uh, to do the job the of narration. If anybody has any ideas or suggestions for that, I'd be happy to hear them today. <laughs> so, uh, in order not to leave this audience clinically depressed, um, <laughs> what concrete steps if you, uh, if you were president of the United States, <laughs> which would have been a wonderful thing, um, what concrete steps do we need to start taking as a country to prevent that most likely of nuclear catastrophes? Let me give you two examples. <clears throat> this scenario could not have happened if the, unless, <clears throat> if the terror group could not get the fissile material to make the bomb. That's the key. One thing that's already happened is that President Obama started something called the Nuclear Security Summit, where he gathered up the 50 leaders of the nations who have fissile material, primarily for commercial reactors, and uh, they all pledged to take better means to protect those. That's a work-in process, so one thing I would hope is that the new administration would somehow continue that effort. No indication they're going to do that, but there's a hope at least that that can be done. That's the best thing we can do to keep a terror group from getting a nuclear bomb, aside from intelligence that break up the terror groups, is stopping them from getting the fissile material. Um, the second, dealing with a much more serious catastrophe than that one, and that would be a, new, a real nuclear war, started as a result of an incorrect response to a false alarm. Uh, the best thing that can be done to happen that is, first of all, for the United States to go off its launch on warning policy, which is based on the belief that the danger is the country's going to make a surprise attack on you, rather than the belief that the real danger is that you'll blunder into a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no evidence that that's going to happen. It didn't happen during the Obama administration, where clearly President Obama understood the dangers of nuclear war, but yet he was not able to make that step. Uh, the second step that could be taken related to that is, for the, for at least for the United States, to uh, phase out its ICBM program. The false alarm is only an issue because of the ICBM, the inter intercontinental missiles, uh, because only the missiles are subject to that surprise attack. The missiles and submarines are not subjected to that problem, and our air, air, um, 
our bombs and airplanes are not subjected to that. So we could phase out our ICBM program. I don't think that's going to happen yet either. But those are the two concrete steps we could take that would basically eliminate that particular danger. And, and one last question. Um, of the 15,000, roughly 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world, more than 90% of them are controlled by two countries, the United States and Russia. And um, how do you feel about the prospect of closer relations with Russia? I mean, certainly during the campaign, there was the depiction of Russia you know, as another evil empire. And to what degree do we engage with a country that we disagree with on so many issues, but you know, is the only other country like ourselves that can destroy the world? And, and what do you see going forward as grounds for optimism? I disagree with Russia and President Putin on many issues, and I don't think we should give in to them on those issues. But in the nuclear field, we have common interests. Neither of us want a nuclear terror attack. I mean, that scene we showed you in Washington could just as well have happened in Moscow. Uh, now, of course, not us wants to start an accidental nuclear war. So on those issues, working to deal with nuclear terrorism, working to do, deal with an accidental nuclear war, there are many things we can do to improve the safety of both countries. On those issues, we ought to be working with them. Uh, I'm, by background, a mathematician, and there's a technique in mathematics known as separation of variables. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that it would be useful if our president and the Russian president could separate the variables, take those issues on which we disagree and are going to continue to disagree, set them aside, and then look at the issues where we have a common interest, like in the nuclear field, and find a way of working together on them. It seems to me that's not beyond human beings' imagination to think of a way of doing that. Thank you, Dr. Perry, and thank you, Eric. Um, let's... oh, I